The topic that I'm going to address sort of picks up our previous two talks quite neatly, I think, in that it looks at freedom, religious liberty and sexuality. I myself am married to Mia, who's a hospital chaplain, and we have two children grown up. And one of them is actually locked down with us uh, due to coronavirus, is doing a PhD at Durham. So the important thing that I want to say from the very start, um, if I can just get my uh, PowerPoint advanced, is that I worked prior to my period in uh, higher education for the Evangelical Alliance in the United Kingdom. And I was there for 10 years, between 1997 and 2006. And during that period, we saw a phenomenal step change in public attitudes to uh, LBGTQ plus issues, as they would now be called, and also a, a massive change in the legislative landscape with a more liberalised uh, set of laws being uh, passed in favour of uh, homosexual and uh, transgender lifestyles. And during that period at the Evangelical Alliance, I was responsible for a number of reports, um, and subsequently I've chaired the Theological Commission of the Alliance, which has produced more, including the ones that you can see on the screen, on both same-sex relationships and latterly on transgender relationships. Now, there's an interesting thought experiment we could do, which is to take key statements from a couple of those reports and ask each other how difficult we find it to articulate those statements in the public square, as emerging leaders in the public square, how easy or difficult is it to voice these particular theological convictions? This one, for example, marriage is an institution created by God in which one man and one woman enter into an exclusive relationship for life. Marriage is the only form of partnership approved by God for sexual relations and homoerotic sexual practice is incompatible with his will as revealed in scripture. How difficult is that to say in a secular civic square. Many of you are involved in parliamentary work, many of you are interfacing with people in the legal profession and in the public sector. Uh, how easy is it to say stuff like that from the Evangelical Alliance text? Or from this, uh, the report Transformed that we published just a couple of years ago. The creation narrative speaks of two distinct and compatible biological sexes, Cross-gender identification is a concern because it distorts the creational order of male and female. Maybe in chat, just as a, another experiment, you might want to put on a scale of one to five how difficult it is to voice those particular convictions in a secular space, perhaps in your internship or in your day-to-day -day work with folk in public life who are not necessarily Christians. You might regarded as relatively easy and then you would mark it as a one but very difficult would be a five so as I do with my students use chat perhaps just to give us a, a quick straw poll on that. I've spoken about my experience of a rapidly changing cultural situation one in which we moved when I joined from the, the Evangelical Alliance uh, from a position in which something like two-thirds to three-quarters of at least the British population would have regarded same-sex relationships as a deviation from moral rectitude or the moral norm to one in which they are now regarded by a majority as perfectly acceptable and by people under the age of 35 in vast numbers as without any difficulty whatsoever. In that same space, in that same period, the nomenclature has become more complicated into the so-called alphabet soup of um, LGBTIQ plus A, you can add asterisks and all kinds of other uh, abbreviations uh, to that particular spectrum. And that's a, in a sense, an indication of how pluralized and diversified the understanding of sex and gender has become, not least in recent years with the rising in profile of transgender uh, issues. Now, classically, Christian theologians have just about begun to get their head around the distinction that's been made for many decades, if not centuries, between sex and gender, a distinction that probably is something like a century old in uh, mainstream understanding. Sex being 
uh, definition of biological characteristics, which are, of course, um, dyadic in relation to male and female anatomy. And gender as something more about roles within a particular subculture or society. The role of the woman as homemaker is not necessarily, arguably by some, uh, inextricably linked with the role of a woman uh, uh, bearing children, or at least arguments about whether a woman should or should not go to work with children, for example, would be arguments more about gender roles than about sex per se. And that binarity has prevailed, um, and still you find it very much in common parlance. But with this changing terminology has, become, uh, a, has come a greater pluralization, particularly of the language of subcategories of gender, the language of queer and non-binary, pangender and polygender has become pervasive. And cisgender is a term that is now contrasted with that pluralization. Cisgender would be something like me, a heterosexual male in a heteronormative, to use the jargon, marriage, a marriage that is according to the historic norm of male and female. And the actor Asia Cat Dillon, for example, uh, American actor from Orange is the New Black, uh, is someone who exemplifies this, who doesn't identify as either male or female, but rather uses the pronoun they to identify themselves in terms of gender. But still, in our historical narrative, the distinction between sex and gender is quite important for many people. And it's linked very closely to um, the evolution of feminism. It's very difficult to exaggerate how important the feminist story is to this whole evolution of um, language around sex and gender, and particularly the pluralization of language around gender. First wave feminism in the normal kind of historiography of this is associated with uh, emancipation of women around suffrage, the capacity to vote, the freedom to vote. And we know the story of how in different countries that came about. Second wave feminism is very much linked in the history with the liberationist narratives of the 1960s. Not in any way incidental there is the uh, rollout of the contraceptive pill in the early 60s, uh, giving in the language of the day women freedom to have multiple sexual partners without the necessary fear of becoming pregnant. And from that tumult of sexual and social revolution in the 1960s comes second wave feminism, which begins to accentuate gender and the stereotypical roles and cultural expectations that have been put on women for decades and centuries, which were beginning to be critiqued by people like Jermaine Greer and Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem, for example. Uh, Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique is really the gateway to Greer's famous 1970 book um, on uh, the female eunuch, which are you know, pillars of second wave feminism. But what's still happening there is this duality between sex and gender, an acceptance that sex is biological and gender is constructed in cultural discourse. Judith Butler, who is one of the um, people who is most prominent in taking the insights of second wave feminism, but applying them most particularly to transgender relationships, is in a way a bridge figure between second wave feminism and what we call third wave feminism. Initially, gender is critiqued and examined quite carefully in her book, Gender Trouble from 1990. And she speaks of gender as a free floating artifice constructed in language, performed in social space. But as her work evolves and as her argument evolves, even in that book, she begins to critique the idea that sex is stable as a binary concept as well. And many Christians, in my experience, even quite sophisticated theologians don't get this, that there is a radical critique of the stability of biology, biologically defined sex. So she talks of the subject of women no longer being understood in stable or abiding terms. And along with Monique Wittig and Cordelia Fine and Felix Burke and others, she begins to look not at biology per se or anatomy so much as neurology and argues that if you 
cross slice a brain of a male and female, the differences seem to be negligible if imperceptible. And that there are other things to look for, particularly about the mental construction of sex and our understanding in language of what sex is that are less easily uh, split down into those binaries of, of male and female. They're drawing in turn on the uh, 60s thought of uh, Michel Foucault and uh, his notion of genealogy, the way that we uh, narrate our reality rather than looking necessarily through hard science at what reality is, the way we construct reality in language. And for Foucault, there's the beginning of a critique of the notion that sex itself is stable. Nothing in man, he says in one essay, not even his body is sufficiently stable to serve as the basis of self-recognition or the understanding of other men. It's very, very hard if you first encounter this to realize how radical it is as a critique of that sex gender distinction that many people still work with. So Butler, towards uh, the end of the opening of Gender Trouble, flags up where she's going and where she's ended up in her most recent work. What is sex anyway? Is there a history of how the duality of sex was established, a genealogy, genealogy that might expose the binary oppositions as a variable construction? And if the immutable character of sex is contested, perhaps this construct called sex is as culturally constructed as gender. So you see how fluid and unstable those classical definitions, even in first and second wave feminism become. Uh, in another work, uh, she says that when a midwife pronounces it's a boy or it's a girl at a birth, she's performing a dramatic script, a cultural script, uh, which uh, overrides uh, considerations of biology. Now, many people regard this, of course, as anti-scientific or unscientific, but in the theological construction of this kind of theory, so-called queer theory, Lisa Isherwood, Winchester University theologian, for example, talks of how it is important to understand that there is a constructionist approach rather than an essentialist approach to biology, that biology is something we narrate in language, we construct mentally, that sexuality becomes pluralistic as a result, and our identity as male or female is in fact to be critiqued by that ambivalent or fluid understanding, both of sex and gender that is there. Now I kind of summarize the philosophy to get to the law because the kind of chronology of this is fascinating in that they marry and they uh, mirror one another, that philosophical and ideological development and the development of the laws passed, at least in the UK since the 60s. Um, I've listed them here. The Sexual Offences Act of 1967, which decriminalised uh, homosexuality, the lowering of the age of consent, an equal age of consent for uh, gay and straight people in 2001, civil partnerships in 2004, and gay marriage in 2014 in Britain, and then in uh, the earlier part of this year in Northern Ireland. All of these reflect those philosophical shifts that we've been seeing. And also uh, the political activism of gay rights, uh, gay rights uh, political figures, um, the Stonewall riots in the late 60s in New York, where gay people uh, objected to police uh, prosecuting them and arresting them for being gay. That narrative of anti-heteronormativity pushes through into uh, legislation, for example, about anti-homophobia and hate speech in the Justice Act of 2003 and the Equality Act in our country of 2010. There are parallels too in North America, and this goes to how easy you find it to talk this kind of theological language of um, the assertion through Genesis 2 and Romans 1 of a marriage between male and female as God's chosen paradigm, chosen model for sexual relations. In 2015, a famous judgment, federal judgment, the Obergefell judgment, uh, made uh, same-sex marriage a constitutional right across the union. And in his book, The Benedict Option, Rod Dreher, who's actually Eastern Orthodox, 
but uh, aligns with a lot of uh, conservative evangelical thinkers, talks of that as the Waterloo of religious conservatism in America. He talks of the cultural war that began in that tumult of the 60s that I've mentioned with the sexual revolution now ending in defeat for Christian conservatives. And he equates the, um, the uh, scandal of articulating a classical Christian conviction now with the scandal of articulating a racist uh, understanding of culture and ethnicity. He makes that parallel. It's interesting to hear Francois say that um, if there is an area where uh, Christian freedoms and liberties might be threatened, it is in the area of sexual ethics. One example from our country uh, recently is the Liberal Democrat leader Tim Farron in 2017 in the general election being grilled on whether he, to quote, thought gay sex was wrong. And uh, he struggled with his role as a political leader and his role as an evangelical Christian. Uh, initially said that there was nothing wrong with it. I think in his head, finessing it around the distinction between orientation and practice, which Christians like to make, but which isn't a distinction that at least British law recognises, and eventually had to resign as leader because he felt his conscience, to quote that word uh, that we heard earlier, was being so seared by this that he could not go on. At Parkfield School in Birmingham last year, Muslim parents in a largely Muslim school in Birmingham withdrew. 80% uh, of them withdrew their children on certain days because of a teaching curriculum that had been influenced by the LGBTQ plus agenda by the organization Stonewall, who uh, grew out of those Stonewall riots in the late 60s. And we all probably are aware of the so-called toilet wars in schools uh, that uh, flow from that uh, broadening of the debate into transgender identities. Posters like this are all over our state schools and some private schools in Britain. Uh, the gingerbread, gingerbread person. Again, in a, interestingly, still playing with the notion that there is a sharp distinction between sexes between your legs, to be crude, as they uh, put it, and um, gender as being in your head. But nonetheless, also playing into the idea of a cline or a spectrum of sexual identity, which is very much being drawn from third wave feminism and queer theology and queer theory. But as those who identify in the ELF space with what I would call classical or evangelical Christianity, we are not the only ones who have reservations. And there may be some hope here for us. So-called uh, trans-exclusionary radical feminists from the second wave of feminism, including Jermaine Greer, and Julie Bindel and Jenny Murray, and also Camille Paglia, have interrogated the assumptions of gender fluidity and that free-floating artifice of sexual construction that's there in Judith Butler's work, and have pushed back. For Pallia, who is no evangelical Christian by any means, who is identified with feminism, nonetheless, there is a deep, deep uh, deep, deep despair and concern about the transgender discourse of sexual and gender fluidity. She, as an art historian, traces this to the um, end of cultures in ancient Greece and Rome, for example, or, for example, the Victorian age, uh, Oscar Wilde, the Pre-Raphaelites, Virginia Woolf's Orlando a little bit later, where she's able to show that this efflorescence, as she puts it, of gender confusion and gender diversity and plurality is not new. It's actually aligned very often with the collapse of a civilization or a culture. And she says very frequently, um, when that uh, decline is happening, there is a response, as there was with public life, at least in 19th century Britain, uh, as compared with the gym palaces and overt prostitution on the streets of 18th century London, or indeed with the uh, decline of the Roman Empire and then the growth of Christendom in the back end of the Roman Empire through the fifth century and beyond. So it's not all one-way traffic. 
And the organization Stonewall that did split has actually, uh, that did evolve, sorry, from the Stonewall riots in America, has itself recently split between those who want to hold to the notion of stability in biological sexual differentiation, if you want to put it this way, historic gay men and lesbians who are attracted to the same sex and need to hold onto that polarity because that's uh, part of that classical narrative. Uh, and those who have been influenced in the mainstream of Stonewall by the transgender, the Judith Butler, the third wave uh, agenda. One other manifestation of this in terms of uh, the debate about freedom and liberty is the a number of referrals to the Tavistock Clinic, which have rocketed in London, a clinic which treats those with gender dysphoria, um, those who believe themselves to be born in the wrong body, um, and has treated increasingly at a rate uh, of increase of something like three to 400% in the last five years or more, uh, children sometimes as young as nine or 10 with puberty blockers and so forth. This in a period where, of course, the rest of society is particularly exercised by the need to safeguard children against the background of uh, abuse, child abuse and the rest. This also against the background in which the best and most reputable studies by Steensmar and uh, others, for example, show a desistance rate, a rate of those presenting as having gender dysphoria of 80%. 80% of those who present decide not to go through with gender reassignment surgery. And in transgender sport as well, uh, Casta Semenya and um, other sports people are known uh, quite widely through the media uh, as those who have kind of been rocketed into this debate about whether it's possible for trans women in particular to compete in traditionally male sports. Um, Martina Navratilova, the great tennis player, and Sharon Davis, the British swimmer, Olympic uh, medal winner, have been held uh, to account and uh, up for quite a lot of criticism by uh, trans activists as a result of this. Now, how does the church respond in this space? I've said at the beginning that it might be quite difficult for some of us to articulate the classical evangelical view of the Evangelical Alliance, for example, uh, in our interfacing with public authorities uh, in a legal and cultural situation that has moved in a far more liberal direction, a far more permissive direction uh, in recent years. And we see this in the fact that certain denominations are, as they might put it, holding the line on the classical view, the Evangelical Alliance itself as a network of church groups, the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches, the Baptist Union, the Presbyterian Church of Northern Ireland. But on the other side, the revisionist side, are an increasing number of denominations that are, for example, uh, affirming liturgies for gay marriage. Uh, not only the Quakers and the United Reformed Church, which have been uh, predominantly liberal for a long time, but the Presbyterian Church USA, the Episcopal Church USA, and quite probably the Methodist Church in Great Britain. This summer, the Church of England is due to publish a report called Living in Love and Faith, which may, according to many reports, uh, move that church from a classic to a revisionist position, although that's not proven yet. Theologically, it's fascinating to see how the narrative of freedom and liberation has informed more liberal understandings of uh, sexuality uh, in our um, church context. There are theologians like Bill Countryman and James Brownson who want to argue from the exegetical approach to biblical texts that we have misunderstood Romans 1, we've misunderstood Genesis 2 with their narrative about the purity of marriage, the purity of male-female exclusive relationships that uh, where they uh, condemn, or a text like Romans 1 or 1 Corinthians 6 condemns same-sex relationships, what it's condemning is a particular form of uh, temple prostitution, for example, or pederasty. There are others, however, who use what I would call a macrothematic hermeneutic, who want to take a concept like liberty or freedom and apply it to the overall salvation history of scripture and say that that trumps that trumps specific micro-exegesis of texts that seem to condemn homosexual relationships. 
So Jeffrey John, Andrew Davidson uh, argue along those lines. Uh, major on the majors, they say. The majors are justice and liberation. They're not um, condemnation of quite probably very specific cultural sexual practices that can stay in the first century or whatever. Others are honest enough, like Dan Vio and Walter Wink, to say, actually, these texts do mean that we have to take a view that the Bible does condemn all forms of, say, same-sex relationship, but they're outmoded. That was then, this is now, they can be discarded. Everybody's got a canon within a canon, and uh, it's legitimate to have a liberative canon of uh, affirmation, theologically, of same-sex and transgender relationships. Others like Mark Actemeyer and Vicky Beeching will go for the therapeutic uh, narrative that uh, the traditional Christian repudiation of uh, same-sex or transgender relationships causes people to get sick, frankly. Um, their freedom is curtailed by mental illness because of the oppression they feel, and therefore on the imperative of a Bible which affirms people's well-being, their human flourishing, so we should set aside texts that appear to move in the other direction. Others like Jane Ozan are more illuminist or pietistic in saying that God just showed me in a dream or vision or a prayer that I should live this way, and others like Marcus Green would argue that it's important for the overall imperative of Christian unity that we find accommodation uh, theologically uh, with these things. But what's interesting in terms of the understanding of freedom uh, that we find uh, in the Christian tradition and in Christian uh, liberty and uh, the Bible is that there are those who want to argue from a liberationist perspective that the racism analogy, for example, is uh, one that we have to take seriously. So Coretta Scott King, Martin Luther King's widow, argues very strongly against Rod Dreher that there is a direct correspondence, as does Jessica Joseph, between uh, same-sex relationships and their repudiation by Christians and uh, the repudiation of black people uh, by Christians, uh, for example, in uh, pre-Civil War uh, America. And the Church of England has flagged up that it wants a radical new inclusion and a proper 21st century understanding of sex in these spaces, which makes that whole narrative, that whole debate quite, uh, quite tense at the moment, if you're an Anglican. Also within evangelicalism, there are figures like Steve Chalk and David Runcorn and Stephen D. Kent and Vicky Beeching I've mentioned and Jane Ozan, who would identify culturally and historically with evangelicalism but are calling from the affirming and including version of that, which is driven again by a narrative of liberation, that they cull from the South American tradition of liberation theology, which takes the Exodus as a political paradigm of liberation, and which makes analogies with slavery and with the freedom of women uh, in feminist discourse, and wants to make a direct parallel. But for a Theologian like William Webb, sticking to a classical evangelical line, he argues that if anything, the repudiation and the uh, critique of same-sex relationships gets stronger as one moves through from the old to the new covenant. Whereas with those other categories of slaves and women, it becomes more liberative than restrictive. There is a danger as we uh, think about these things of what Herbert Butterfield called Whig progressivism and C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery. For both of them, the notion that there is an inevitable upward arc in our moral progress is severely limited by the evidence of human history. For Pallia, you remember, there is actually a parallel to be drawn between the dissipation of society and the efflorescence of gender fluidity or sexual diversity. And in Lewis's narrative, chronological snobbery is the assumption that just because we live, say, in the 21st century, we are morally superior. So how is it that we maintain a sense of what we are liberated into while also understanding that there is an alternative discourse of liberty in these secular narratives, 
in these third way narratives. I think it's important to, to loop back finally to what David was saying earlier on, which is that liberty in the Christian understanding is being liberated from slavery to sin and being liberated to servanthood, servanthood of Jesus Christ, servanthood and even slavery in a particular understanding uh, being part of that. And so, for instance, when we look at Jesus as an example of laying down his life, of dying in humility for his friends, we see liberty, we see freedom expressed through a choice to be subject to the sovereignty of God. And in the best understanding, as I um, would put it, of religious liberty, drawing on that tradition of John Locke, there is an understanding that in order to be free in a free society, it is necessary to constrain oneself according to law and according to particularly the golden rule or the golden law of love for one's neighbor. There's a reciprocity that comes from being conscious of the humility and meekness and charity, as Locke puts it in his letter concerning toleration, which is supremely embodied in Jesus, but which has been lost, I would argue, in some of the culture wars and the conflict that characterizes the um, attempt to marginalize uh, Christian uh, expressions of freedom around that classical evangelical narrative. So as I conclude, um, I would point to the fact that there have been cases, some of you will be familiar with the Ashes Bakery case in Northern Ireland, uh, where a very complex judgment on appeal was eventually reached, defending the conscience of two bakers who would not bake a cake affirming gay pride for a gay couple, but where the slogan that they refused to put on the cake and the refusal to do so was deemed to be directly discriminatory. So that would be a good example of the, the tension. There is still a respect in that judgment, the Ashes judgment, for individual conscience, but a cultural judgment on them for being out of sync with what's now considered to be discrimination. So I would come back to the question with which I began. How easy is it? for us to articulate what I would want to say is a classical Christian understanding of our faith and our freedom to express that faith in the situations that we inhabit as emerging leaders. And as we do so, you might want particularly to consider your reaction to Rod Dreher's analogy, where he says that now it's as hard for Christians to express an affirmation of traditional marriage uh, between a man and a woman, uh, as it might be for somebody to express a, a racist opinion. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't want to make that analogy. Going back to William Webb, we want to say these are two different things, and racism is utterly unacceptable for uh, Jesus who commended a gospel to go to all the nations, all the Gentiles. But nonetheless, I think that uh, Drea makes a pertinent point and it would be good to hear your responses to it. And with that, I close. <laughs>